Part 14 The Process of Discipleship In the parable of the sower, the seeds sown on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Luke 8 verse 15 The principle of growth is always first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear, Mark 4, verse 28. Therefore, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it, James 5, verse 7. And as this clearly exemplifies, he that believeth shall not make haste, Isaiah 28, verse 16. For most of us it has been a long season of growth, from the tiny green blade up to the full corn in the ear. So many seek to settle for this stage, saved, with heaven assured, plus a pacifying measure of Christian respectability, at least in church circles. Here we have the believer as a normal kernel of wheat, containing life inside a more or less shiny golden covering in fellowship high up on the stalk with similar kernels of wheat. This is but a stage, not the goal. And like middle age, this can be a dangerous stage, one of seeking a much deserved rest or basking aimlessly in the fellowship of meetings and classes and so on and so forth. And of ignoring or forgetting the struggles and the growing pains of the tiny green blades down at one's feet and expecting and exhorting them to shape up and to mature without delay. This is all very cosy, but costly, snug, but sterile. The seed corn may be beautiful, but it's hard. The germ of life is locked up within its shell and cannot get out. Therefore, it produces nothing. Here is the reason why so many Christians, even preachers, are so unfruitful. Only one here and there is a soul winner. When the grain of corn is buried, it dies. And that hard exterior surface softens and decays in order to give nutrients to the young sprout, which would otherwise die and thus cause a crop failure. One must reckon himself dead to the hard, cold self, I, before the softening influence of the Holy Spirit can operate, qualifying the believer in the service of God. Many want to do God's work but are unable because of the flesh in their lives. Our Father understands this, and he it is who takes the initiative in the matter. He drops the seeds of dissatisfaction into our hearts. He begins to show us that there is far more to this Christian life than just being saved and, and being active for him. And it's necessary for him to engineer our exchange from carnal kernel Christians to fruitful fellowshipping disciples. From an infinite number of ways, he chooses the most effective for each individual transition. And in the hands of the husbandman, there is no fear, but freedom. We often come across Christians who are bright and clever, strong and righteous. In fact, a little too bright and a little too clever. And there seems so much of self in their strength and their righteousness is severe and critical. They have everything to make them saints except crucifixion, which would mould them into a supernatural tenderness and limitless charity for others. But if they are of the real elect, God has a wine press prepared for them through which they will someday pass, which will turn the metallic hardness of their nature into gentle love, which Christ always brings forth at the last of the feast. 
we read that another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. He that soweth the seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Matthew 13, verse 24. The Lord of the harvest plants, buries Christians as seeds in a field, which is the world. Through the husbandman's patient and loving cultivation, the grain of wheat high on the stalk begins to fear being garnered alone and hungers to bring forth much fruit. Here is God's motivation for discipleship, that filial heart hunger for fruit bearing. He finally pleads to be made fruitful at any cost. And then it is that he hears the Lord saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abide alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. John 12, 24. And whoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Mark 8, 35. In loving response to this hunger, the Holy Spirit silently and gently begins to loosen the grain from its comfortable bindings and support in the kernel. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come, Mark 4.29. As a result, sooner or later the grain of wheat finds itself not high up on the stalk, but dropped to the earth, into the cold and strange darkness, and still worths. The earth smears and injures that nice, shiny golden coat, and worst of all, the coat begins to disintegrate and to fall to pieces. All that is not Christ, no matter how nice in appearance and profession, is revealed for what it is, just self. And then there's a further stripping down, right down to the germ of life, right on down until there is nothing left but Christ, who is our life, down, down into death. Patience, grain of wheat. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13, verse 15. Except it fall into the ground and die, can much fruit come alone at such a cost? Must the seed corn be buried in the earth? All summer joy and glory seemingly lost. He buries still his seed corn here and there and calls to deeper fellowship with him, those who will dare to share the bitter cup and yet while sharing sing the triumph hymn. Except it fall into the ground and die? But what a harvest in the days to come, when fields stand thick with golden sheaves of corn, and you are sharing in the harvest home. To you who lose your life and let it die, yet in the losing find your life anew. Christ evermore unveils his lovely face, and thus his mirrored glory rests on you. When the believer takes up his cross for discipleship, the process of death begins to set in. The disciple finds himself a seed sown by the sun, planted in a home, in an office or a hospital, church, manse, mission statement, wherever. So whatever or wherever it is, there will be the death from which resurrection life follows. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. 2 Corinthians 4, 11 and 12. We need to enter deeply into the truth that Christ, the beloved Son of the Father, could not enter into the glory of heaven until he had first given himself over to death. And this great truth, as it opens to us, 
will help us to understand how in our life and in our fellowship with Christ, it is impossible for us to share his life until we have first in every deed surrendered ourselves every day to die to sin and self and the law and the world and so to abide in the unbroken fellowship of discipleship with our crucified and risen Lord. Remember that all the truths that we have learned about the cross of our death with Christ, our death unto sin with him, of our conformity to death like the corn of wheat falling into the ground to die, these are all preparatory to the overcoming life. They are the foundation of and the fundamentals to it. Part 15. Rest. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into rest, he also hath ceased from his own work, as God did from his. Let us labour therefore to enter into the rest. Hebrews 4 verses 9 to 11. So many of the life-giving truths in the word consist of two intertwining halves that are inseparable. Let us labour therefore to enter into the rest. As for labour, it is true that there is a great deal of struggling and searching, pleading and agonising in the process of discovering and understanding truths fitted to our needs. Let us labour therefore to enter into the rest. And much of the same pathway is trodden or crawled in an effort to appropriate and enter in. All this is not in vain. It's necessary. But it's not the key that opens the door to the reality. Rest is the key to the entering into the rest. In the important but exhausting labour process, we come to see the needed truth. We become sure of our facts. We begin to realise something of what is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. The appropriation of the resting in the reality must be on the basis of faith, not struggle and labour. We are told to reckon, to count on what we know to be true of us in him and set forth in the word of God. In Isaiah 30 verse 15, we read, In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. We are to quietly and steadily look to the Father in confident trust and thankfully receive that which he has given to us in his Son. In Psalm 104 verses 27 and 28, we read this, These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season, that thou givest them they gather, thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Norman Grubb shares a good word on the principle of labour and rest. He says this, Take as an example the learning of a foreign language. You are faced with a series of hieroglyphics in a book. You hear a medley of sound around, which means absolutely nothing to you, and yet you know that it's a language that can be learned. More than that, you have gone there to learn it. Now this is the first rung in the ladder of faith. However weak or waveringly in your heart you do believe that you can and will get it, otherwise, obviously, you wouldn't try to learn the language, and so you plod on. Many a time faith and courage fail. The mind is weary and the heart is heavy, but you almost give up, but not quite. To give up is faith's unforgivable sin. So on you go, months past. It seems largely to go in one ear and out of the other. And then the length of time depends on the difficulty of the language and the ability and industry of the pupil, of course, but then a miracle seems to happen. The day or period comes when, 
without you hardly realising. What you are seeking has been found by you. What you are trying to grasp has been grasped by you. And you begin automatically to speak the language, to think it, to hear it. What was an incomprehensible jumble of sounds without has become an ordered language within the mind. So it is in the spiritual labour of faith. The moment or period comes when we know. Every vestige of strain and labour is gone. Indeed, faith as such is not felt or recognised anymore. The channel is lost sight of in the abundance of the supply. And as we come to know that we are the children of God by an inner certainty, a witness of the spirit in our spirits, so we now come to know that the old I is crucified with Christ and the new I has Christ as its permanent life, our spirit with the spirit, which has been fused into one, the branch grafted into the vine, the member joined to the body, the problem of abiding becomes as natural as breathing. Thank God for the needs that just will not allow the hungry heart to stop short of finding their meat in him. It is necessary to remember a fundamental principle in the spiritual life, and it's this, that God only reveals spiritual truths to meet spiritual needs. How many rest on the initial stage of the new birth, begotten again, begotten of incorruptible seed through the word of God, 1 Peter 1, 23, but then fail to press on to know, begotten by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, unto an inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 3. Through the years, the hungry-hearted believer finds that he has been brought a long way, and each step of the way has been personally experienced. Reality that springs from faith, founded on the facts of the word of God. The more clearly we enter by faith into objective truth, or what is true of us in Christ, the deeper, more experiential and practical will the subjective work in us, and more complete will be the manifestation of the moral effects in our life and in our character. Oh yes, brought a long way, walking one step at a time by faith. The rest of faith concerning our justification, the rest of faith concerning our acceptance, the rest of faith concerning our position in Christ Jesus, the rest of faith concerning our identification with Christ in death, in resurrection and in ascension, step by step. And each of these steps established in the rest of faith, which brings us to the next step. Each must be settled on before the next one can be rested upon. It cannot be too strongly stated that unless the believer is firmly established in the steps of Romans chapters 1 to 5, he cannot truly enter the rest of the truths found in Romans chapters 6 to 8. No matter how many special meetings or conferences he attends, or so-called revivals that he becomes involved in. Dr James of Albany, who was used to bring hundreds into deeper truths, declared that he usually found that failure in the higher stages of Christian life was due to imperfect understanding and acceptance of the gospel of salvation in its fundamental principles. It's a rare thing to be able to sit down and teach, because in most settings today one is limited to dealing with the first principles of the oracles of God, and then can go no further than the basic facts of the new birth, being born again. You cannot deepen spiritual life that isn't there. You will only build a skew if the foundations are not properly laid. 
a lack of appreciation of the wonders of a full salvation in Christ opens the door to every kind of overbalance and spells continual frustration and failure. Believers often manage to trust God for truths that they need, only to slip from grace into the legal realm in seeking to produce the particular truths in their life for service. Once in possession of a truth, we are to rest in that truth. He will produce. In actual experience, when we've apprehended our deliverance through death with Christ, the self-life often appears more alive than ever. Just here, God would have a stand firm, that is to rest, to stand firm upon his written word. The increasing revelation proves the surrender to the cross to be real because the Holy Spirit takes us at our word and reveals all that he has seen lying underneath. He reveals that it may be dealt with at the cross. Our part is to yield our wills and take God's side against ourselves, while the Holy Spirit applies the death of the cross to all that is contrary to him so that it may be really true that we who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, Galatians 5.24. The faith that receives from the hand of the Father is in two stages, and we are not to give up just because the struggle and labour phase doesn't produce the prize, according to your faith be it unto you. And do not let us forget, faith begins by being a labour, Hebrews 4.11. It begins by being a fight, 1 Timothy 6.12. Although it is consummated in a rest, Hebrews 4 verse 3. That is to say that the first stage of faith is always a battle of taking hold by the will, heart and intelligence of some truth or promise which isn't real to us in experience and declaring it to be ours in spite of the appearance. We do not appear to be dead unto sin and alive unto God, but we are told to believe it, and so we dare to do it and declare it to be so. A thousand times, maybe, faith will be assaulted and will fall. Unbelief will say, oh, nonsense, and we shall belie our declaration of faith. But the labour of faith means that we deliberately return to the assault. And once again, we believe and declare it. This we persist in doing. As we thus follow in the steps of those who, by faith and patience, inherit the promise, a new divine thing will happen within us. The Spirit will cooperate with our faith, as he is invisibly doing all the time, and to faith will be added assurance and labour will be replaced by rest, and the consummation of faith will have been reached. True activity is that which springs out of and is ever accompanied by rest. It is only as we know what it is to be still that we are ready to go forward. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Let us take care lest we get out of our soul rest in seeking further blessing. God cannot work while we are anxious, even about our spiritual experience. So let us take him at his word and leave the fulfilment of it to him. Part 16, Help. For most of us, it is time to stop asking God for help. He didn't help us to be saved, and he doesn't intend to help us to live the Christian life. Immaturity considers the Lord Jesus a helper. Maturity knows him to be the life within. J.E. Conant wrote this. He said, 
Christian living is not our living with Christ's help. It is Christ living his life in us. Therefore, that portion of our lives that is not his living isn't Christian living. And that portion of our service that is not his doing isn't Christian service. For all such life and service has but a human and a natural source. And Christian life and service has a supernatural and a spiritual source. Paul insisted this. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13. William R. Newell said this. Satan's great device is to drive earnest souls back to beseeching God for what he says that he has already done. Each of us had to go beyond the help stage for our new birth and thank him for what he has already done on our behalf. God could never answer a prayer for help in the matter of justification and the same principle holds true for the Christian life and Christian living. Our Lord Jesus waits to be wanted and to be all in us and to do all through us. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Bodhead godly, and ye are complete in him. Colossians 2 verse 9 and 10. God is not trusted nor honoured in our continually asking him for help. In the face of, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 9. In the face of that, how can we beg for help? For God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Our responsibility is to see in the word of God all that is ours in Christ and then to thank him and trust him for that which we need. Sooner or later we must face up to what F.G. Hugel declared. He said, when a Christian's prayer life springs from a right position, that is a thorough adjustment to Christ in his death and resurrection, when a Christian's prayer life springs from a right position, a vast change in procedure follows. Much of the mere begging type of prayer, though of course asking is always in order, for the Lord says, ask and you shall receive. No, much of the mere begging type of prayer gives way to our positive and unspeakable joyous appropriation. Much of our begging fails to register in heaven because it fails to to spring from a right relation with the Father in union with Christ in his death and resurrection, in which position one simply appropriates what is already his. All things, says the Apostle Paul, all things are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22. Since, as Hebrews 11.6 says, since without faith it is impossible to please him, we might consider several more strong but true statements to clarify the attitude of faith that does please God's heart. In our private prayers, as well as in our public service, A.W. Tozer writes this, we are forever asking God to do things that he's either already done or cannot do because of our unbelief. We plead with him to speak when he's already spoken and is at that very moment speaking to us. We ask him to come when, when he's already present and waiting for us to recognise him. We beg the Holy Spirit to fill us while all the time we are preventing him by our doubts. S.D. Gordon admonished, by saying that when you are in the thick of the fight, when you are the object of attack, 
plead less and claim more on the grounds of the blood of the Lord Jesus. I don't mean that you should ask God to give you the victory. No, you need to claim the victory to overshadow you. Watchman Nee startles many by saying this. God's way of deliverance is altogether different from man's way. Man's way is to try to suppress sin by seeking to overcome it. God's way is to remove the sinner. Many Christians mourn over their weakness, thinking that if only they were stronger all would be well. The idea that because failure to lead a holy life is due to our impotence, something more therefore is demanded of us and leads us naturally to this false conception of the way of deliverance. If we are preoccupied with the power of sin and with our inability to meet it, then we naturally conclude that to gain the victory over sin, we must have more power. Oh, if only I was stronger, we say. I could overcome my violent outbursts of temper. Oh, and so we plead with the Lord to strengthen us, that we may exercise more self-control. But this is altogether wrong. This is not Christianity. God's means of delivering us from sin is not by making us stronger and stronger, but by making us weaker and weaker. This is surely a peculiar way of victory, you say? But it is the divine way. God sets us free from the dominion of sin, not by strengthening our old man, but by crucifying him. Not by helping him to do anything, but by removing him from the scene of action. The believer does not have to beg for help. Rather, he does have to thankfully appropriate that which is already his in Christ. For we read in Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. And dear old Andrew Murray encourages us with these words. Even though it is slow and with many a stumble, the faith that always thanks him, not for the experiences, but for the promises on which it can rely, the faith that thanks him goes on from strength to strength still increasing in the blessed assurance that God himself will perfect his work in us. Philippians 1 verse 6. 17. Cultivation. There can be little question concerning the importance of balance, so vital in the mechanical, physical, aesthetic and spiritual realms. Faulty balance often results in disintegration, and possible devastation to the surrounding area. Our self-life is out of balance. It's all one-sided, like the Universal Tea Party. I had a little tea party one afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests in all. Just I, myself and me. Myself ate up the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. It was also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. Because he is the great husbandman, the beginning of God's cultivation of the hungry-hearted believer is downward. Patiently, persistently and painfully our father digs down into the recesses of self, more and more fully revealing to us just what we are and are not in ourselves. His reason for the preparation is twofold, that the Lord Jesus might be free to manifest himself in us and through us for the sake of others, growing and sharing. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Isaiah 58 verse 11. Each of us must be thoroughly cultivated before we can effectively cultivate others through us. It is not that there will be no service for us until we're spiritually mature. 
but that most of our service on the way to maturity is for our own development and not so much for that of others. At first, the growing believer thinks and would have others feel that all his service is effective. But in time, he comes to realise that the Lord is not doing so much through him as he is in him. Our Lord always concentrates on the greater need. Since the work of God is essentially spiritual, it demands spiritual people for its doing. And the measure of their spirituality will determine the measure of their value to the Lord. Because this is so, in God's mind, the servant is more than the work. If we are going to come truly into the hands of God for his purpose, then we shall be dealt with by him in such a way as to continually increase our spiritual measure. Not our interest in Christian work or our energies, enthusiasm or ambitions, or our abilities, not our academic qualifications, or, or anything, anything at all that is in ourselves, but simply our spiritual life is the basis of the beginning and the growth of our service to God. Even the work, when we're in it, even the work is used by him to increase our spiritual measure. It is a mistake to measure spiritual maturity merely by the presence of gifts. By themselves, they're inadequate basis for man's lasting influence to God. They may be present and they may be valuable, but the Spirit's object is something far greater, and that's to form Christ in us through the working of the cross. His goal is to see Christ inwrought in believers. So it's not merely that a man does certain things or speak certain words, but that he is a certain kind of man. He himself is what he preaches. Too many want to preach without being the thing themselves, but in the long run it is what we are, and not simply what we do or say that matters with God, and the difference lies in the formation of Christ within. We are not saved to serve, we are matured to serve. Only to the extent that cultivation reveals self for what it is are we in the position to assist others in their cultivation. We find out everyone else by first finding out ourselves. As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Proverbs twenty-seven nineteen. To counterbalance knowledge of self, our Father enables us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. This is not only true concerning general service, but also in the matter of our ministry of intercession. More than anything else, the service of prayer for others necessitates a triune understanding, that of the Father, of ourselves and of others. Praying for others can only flow from a heart at rest about itself and one that knows the value of the desires which it expresses for another. That was a quote from Stoney and, and he finishes by saying I couldn't be happy praying any other way. Paul wrote that he would pray with the Spirit, that he would pray by the Holy Spirit that is within me, but that I will pray intelligently, with my mind and understanding. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 So many of us, after having entered into some of the deeper realities of our Lord, seek to immediately push or pull others into this wonderful advancement, and then we wonder why they're so slow to learn, and seemingly apathetic in their understanding and concern. We so easily forget the many years it took and what wandering wilderness ways our Lord had to traverse with us to bring us over the Jordan and into Canaan. Moses had all the wisdom of the Egyptians and yet his idea of delivering Egypt was to slay an Egyptian. He had to be trained in God's ways, having 40 years in Midian. And when he was sent back to Egypt, God said to him not to trouble about Israel, 
to go straight to Pharaoh, the cause of their chains. God didn't train Israel at first, but a leader to lead Israel. God seeks to get leaders trained in the knowledge of his ways. To the extent that we learn how the Father has had to handle us through the years, will we understand how he would have us share with others? We must be cultivated to be cultivators. It is injurious for one believer to be forcing another into blessings which that soul may not be ready for. Forced advance really gives the enemy his opportunity to mislead. For those who try to rush on at the push of others cannot stand alone, nor bear the tests of their assumed positions. Then, too, in all our service, there is the proper motive to be considered. Work should be regarded less with reference to its immediate result or as to how it may affect this or that person. The great question is this. Will it, when sifted in his presence, will it be acceptable to him? And this acceptability to him is my reward. Wherefore we labour that, whether present or absent, we may be acceptable to him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 Many seem to droop because there are no grapes and they're not happy unless they are doing. Well, doing's right enough in itself. But the order ought to be from happiness to work, not from work to being happy. It is from the inner circle from the hive, from the heart where Christ reigns, the only green spot, the fond enclosure, the sanctuary. It is from that place that one should come forth to work. The quality of one's work depends on the nature of one's rest, and the rest should be like his own, known and enjoyed with him. We have but small ideas of how our outward bears the colour of the inward. And if our inward is not restful, there cannot be a rest imparting service, however it may be attempted. But do remember this, that the greatest proof of our love for Christ is that we care for those who belong to him. Jesus said, if you love me, Feed my sheep. 18. Continuance When we first start out hungry and zealous for him, it's often imagined that extensive progress has been made when as yet we've barely begun. As our Lord takes us along through the years, it slowly dawns upon us that oh, there are vast, almost infinite areas of development through which he must still lead us. Many of these development areas are just, well, plain desert. No spiritual activity, no service, little or no fellowship with him or others. What prayer there is has to be forced and sometimes dropped altogether for months at a time. Bible study finally grinds to a halt. Oh, and everything seems to add up to nothing. It's during these necessary times that the believer often feels that God has ceased to carry out his part and there is little or no use in seeking to continue on. And yet, there is a hunger deep within that will not allow him to quit. We read in 2 Timothy 2.19, The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Are we to love and trust and respond to him only when he seems to be blessing us? For what sort of love is that? Self-love? Our Father strips everything away from time to time to give us the opportunity of loving and trusting and responding to him just because he is our Father. He knows what the cross is going to mean in our lives. He knows the death march that lies ahead of us in order that there may be resurrection life. He knows the barren, bleeding hearts beyond to whom he must minister through us. Hence, he is going to bring us to the place where we just don't care what happens, but he is all that matters. Sonship 
is something more than being born again. It represents growth into fullness. It's quite a good thing to be a babe while babyhood lasts, but it's a bad thing to be a babe when that period is past. This is the condition of many Christians. While sonship is inherent in birth, in the New Testament sense, sonship is the realization of the possibilities of birth. It is growth to maturity. So the New Testament has a lot to say about growing up, leaving childhood, and attaining unto full stature. With this growth comes the greater fullness of Christ and the abundant wealth into which we are saved. It's a matter not so much of that from which we are saved, as of that unto which we are saved. The grand climax of the new creation is the revealing of the sons of God, as we read in Romans 8, 19. In the beginning, we are mainly taken up with the externals of our Christian life, and the Lord allows this for a time. Then to get us and our externals out of the way, so that the Lord Jesus can be our all, our Father begins to take away much of what we thought we had. He begins the long, cross-centred transition from do to be. All this paradoxical progress, the way up being down, has a strong tendency to make us feel that the Lord is not taking us on. This is simply a weapon of the enemy, and it's easily parried by letting God be God in the scriptural knowledge that he is our Father. It's true that God does take up those who are not worthy and, and permit them to speak his words years before they fully understand their import. But he does not wish any of us to stop there. We may go on in that way for a while, but is it not true that from the time when he began in us his work of formation through discipline and chastening, it growingly dawns on us how little, in fact, we knew of the true meaning of what we had been saying and doing. God intends that we should reach the place where we can speak, with or without manifest gifts, because we are the things we say. For in Christian experience, the spiritual things of God are less and less outward, that is, of gift, and more and more inward of life. In the long run, it is the depth and inwardness of a work that counts. As the Lord himself becomes more and more to us, other things, yes, and this must include even his gifts, other things matter less and less. Then, though we teach the same doctrine, speak the same words, the impact on others is very different, manifesting itself in an increasing depth of the Spirit's work within them also. His relentless processing will discourage and baffle us if we simply want heaven when we die. Oh, but if we want what he wants, all that we are taken through, including the desert, will encourage us. Thus we will continue because we know that he ever continues to work in and through us that which he began and finished on our behalf in our Lord Jesus Christ. If our hearts are really true to him, we may be assured that he will lead us on in the knowledge of himself, just as fast as we are able to advance. He knows how much we can take in, and he doesn't fail to minister to us the very food that is suitable to our present need. Or we may sometimes feel inclined to be impatient with ourselves because we do not make more rapid progress. But we have to learn to trust the Lord with spiritual education. If our eyes are upon him and we follow with simple hearts as he leads us, we shall find that he leads us by a right way and brings us through all the exercises we need to form our souls in the appreciation of himself and of all those blessed things which are brought to pass in him. We have to trust his love all through and to learn increasingly to distrust ourselves. Paul writes to us as he did to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 
Thou therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2, 1-3 We rejoice with you as you continue in him. The Lord is faithful who shall establish you. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3